27. So turn with me in your Bibles there. Colossians 1. Be reading verses 26 and 27. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Sometimes parents are surprised by the thoughtful questions their children ask. For example, a young boy once asked his father, Daddy, what is God like? The father was unprepared for such a deep question and struggled to answer in a way that the child could understand. Seeing his father struggling, the boy asked, Daddy, is God like the sun? No, his father replied. Is he like the moon? No. Is he like an angel? No, he's not like an angel. Becoming impatient, the boy said, Well, Daddy, what is God like? The father, finally thinking of an example, said, Son, God is not like the creation, nor is he like an angel. Do you remember at Grandpa's house last (coughs) Christmas when Grandpa read the story about the birth of Christ? Yes. Do you remember after Grandpa finished reading, you felt so much love coming from him and saw how peaceful his face looked, and you turned to me and you said you felt the presence of God in the room? Yes. Well, son, that's what God is like. You see, son, we learn a lot about God at church, in Sunday school, in our family devotions. And when you read your Bible as well, but when you become saved, God actually comes to live inside your heart. And you experience a personal relationship with Him. No longer do you just know things about Him, but you come to know Him personally in a very special way. He becomes a very close friend and even closer than my relationship with you as a father and as a child. You see, son, there's a higher goal in the knowledge we get about God from the Bible. The main reason why we teach you all these things from the Bible is that you'll be united to Jesus Christ in your heart and in your spirit. This is why Jesus Christ, God's Son, was sent into the world and suffered such a terrible death on the cross that we just celebrated, the Lord's Supper. He died to save us from our sins so that we could love Him and know Him and enjoy fellowship with him. So the son finally said, Now I understand, Daddy. God wants to save us so that I can have so much love for him in my heart, just like I have for you and Mom and Grandpa and Grandma, right? That's right, son. So we want to talk about that on a spiritual level. We want to talk about union with Christ, especially as illustrated in five metaphors in the New Testament. In the New Testament, the Lord Jesus expounds and expands upon what it's like to know God in our hearts, what it's like to have Him in us, the hope of glory. And He uses parables and illustrations or metaphors to describe what it's like to have this intimate heart knowledge of Jesus Christ. As this father used an analogy his child can understand in describing a spiritual truth, so God uses metaphors and parables in the Bible to teach us one of the greatest mysteries in the world, union with God himself. This is why we were created, and this is why we were saved. The ultimate calling and awesome privilege of a human being is to know God personally in our hearts and to have his presence dwelling within us in the person of his spirit. And this is a very great and sacred stewardship to nurture and to safeguard and take care of this union we have with God himself. God is infinite in understanding and wisdom, but we are finite. So in condescending mercy, he stoops stoops to our level using illustrations drawn from everyday life and every area of life, from agriculture, from marriage, from the human body, from the construction of a building, and from the family relationship to describe what it really means to know God in our hearts. These metaphors are simple teaching tools designed to lead the seeking soul 
into fellowship with God, which is God's ultimate purpose for man. Salvation is but a stepping stone in the process. Salvation is very important, but it's the gateway. It's the entryway. It's not the be-all, end-all. Salvation just begins this process of an eternal union and communion with the living God himself and of all of God's creatures. He has chosen us, his children, human beings made in his image and saved and given his own nature to know him and enjoy fellowship with him forever. And it is so tragic that we so often forget this highest of all purposes for Hugh and I as his children. And the Bible exhorts pastors and teachers and even fellow believers in their relationship with one another to exhort and remind one another about this highest and holiest of callings. It will be our sole employment in heaven forever. And so these metaphors are just teaching tools and salvation itself is but a stepping stone in the process, although a very important one. A metaphor is a thing seen as a symbol of something else. A metaphor is a comparison, an allegory, an analogy. And because union with God is man's supreme calling and purpose, it's not surprising that the scriptures are loaded with metaphors and parables explaining in rich detail this greatest of all mystery and greatest of all privilege, Christ in you, the hope of glory. There are three types of metaphors describing union with Christ that we'll look at. The first is drawn from earthly experience and the creation. The second metaphor are, are, are those which find their expression in the togethers in the New Testament. And the third is having to do with this whole idea of oneness. Oneness between God and His church. It's a very important metaphor, oneness, where the two become one, just like a marriage, where the two become one. There's a spiritual application of oneness between God and His church, and that's your calling and my supreme calling. Your job, your own earthly marriage, and as good as these other things that we do in our daily routine may be, for us to be able to survive and to live in this world both physically and emotionally and so forth, your greatest calling and mine is to be one with God Himself. Let's look at the first metaphor, the head and the body. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. So, starting off with Colossians 1, 26 and 27, where we see that Christ in you, the hope of glory, is our ultimate purpose. Let's, through this textual and topical message, move on to other scriptures that will describe in fuller detail these metaphors. The first metaphor, of course, the head and the body, as seen in Ephesians 4, 15 and 16. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. So, again, a metaphor being an analogy, God uses the human body as, as a symbol describing his relationship with his people. Christ is the head and we are the body. The head is symbolic of Christ. The body represents the church. We have a fuller explanation of this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where 25 verses describe the different parts of the body. The body is one, but we th there are different members in the body. But there's only one head, and the head is a symbol of Christ who directs the body, who controls the body, and the body follows the directions of the head, but there are many parts in the body, and so is the church. So is the church. The church is one with one another and with Christ, but the church has many members. Turn to Ephesians 1. You're, you're in Ephesians 4. Turn over to Ephesians 1. Let's look at verses 22 and 23. Part of this idea of the head and the body as a metaphor represents the doctrine of the church. 
the doctrine of the church, whereby the church's ultimate purpose in being one with Christ, the head, is laid out here in various texts in the book of Ephesians. And of course, the theme of Ephesians is the the church of or the yeah the church of Christ the theme of colossians is the christ of the church but in ephesians we have this very rich explanation of the body's relationship with the head of the church's relationship with Jesus Christ and we read in chapter 1 verse 22 and following and he that is christ put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. So he is the head over the body, and we are the body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And so the head is symbolic of Christ, and the body represents the church, which is where the term body of Christ comes from. Okay? The benefit of the head to the body is immense and immeasurable. And indispensable. Without the head, the body cannot function. The body cannot function. But it can function without other members. If they cut off my arm, my body can still function. I can heal. Which is not as vital to our survival as the head is. The head controls the massive amount of functions and activities in the body. The head sends signals to every part of the body. Do this, do that, go there, go there. Look at this, look at that, think this, think that. The brain sends signals to the nerves and cells that are choreographed with amazing precision so that the body doesn't suffer or lack in any way. And so does Christ control the church in the same way. Christ sends massive signals to the body. He, or he gives tons of teachings in the Bible about what to do in almost every single conceivable situation. And if we don't have specific directions and everything, he gives us general guidelines to apply to areas that we can't figure out specifically so that in the end, the head of the body gives us direction how to live in this world and how to function in the church, how to share the gospel, how to relate to every conceivable person in our lives. The head provides direction and government, <clears throat> and so does Christ for the church. But notice the importance of the internal attachment, the internal attachment between the head and the body. The internal attachment between the head and the body, that is what's inside the head that attaches itself to the body, provides first of all a sense of well-being. As the brain directs the body, resulting in a sense of health and well-being, and well so Christ nourishes the church, resulting in peace and joy, assurance, and a sense of spiritual well-being. The internal attachment between the head and the body provides nourishment. As the brain directs the digestive system to provide nourishment for the body, as my brain tells my the digestive system, break down the pickles and the tuna fish and the rye bread, break down the bagels, lox, and cream cheese, and send the nourishment everywhere, but try to include some protein in there somewhere so that the whole physical body of Joe Jackowitz is nourished. The Lord Jesus directs the spiritual part of our inward man to provide the balance of nutrition we need in every area of our spiritual lives. The internal attachment between the head and body provides healing from sickness. As the head directs the nerves, blood clotting, and cells to bring healing to illness and damage to the body, so Christ provides healing for the church when she is weak, wounded, or sick, and lame. The brain sends a, rep a repair crew if the body is damaged. And spiritually, the same is true between Christ and the church. Do we not read in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, he restores my soul. And that's why we're here today. He keeps on healing and restoring our spiritual man when we go astray. Praise God for that. Amen. Worship him for that. Glorify him for that. The internal attachment provides unity as well. 
as the brain coordinates all the activities, functions of the body so that everything works in unity, harmony, and agreement. So, so in the same way, the Lord Jesus directs all the members of the body to work in harmony and unity with one another for the glory of God and the good of the church. Can you imagine if you broke your hand and the brain says to the, uh, the, brain says to the eyes and, and to the other hand, go get a gauze pad and stop the bleeding. And then the brain says to the vocal cords, scream in pain. Mm -hmm. And then the, gray, the brain says to the legs, stand up, go to the car, tell, tell your wife to drive you to the emergency room. And let's say that's me. And I do everything, but I scream to Sherry as well, get the car ready, you got to take me to the emergency room. But my legs refuse to stand up and obey what my brain is telling it and to walk to the car so Sherry can drive me to the ER. Okay. Now, in the same way, <clears throat> the body has to all function together. All, as, all of us as members of the body need to be doing everything that God commands us as members to do so that there's no lacking in finances in the giving area of our church. There's no lacking in the body ministering to one another with our diverse spiritual gifts, reaching out to one another. No lacking in showing hospitality. No lacking whatsoever. And as long as we follow all of these spiritual responsibilities laid out in the doctrine of the church as our relationship with one another is described and as our consciences are pressed in with conviction from these commandments to do our part as members of the body no area of the body then will lack when there is a need right mm -hmm. and so that's an exhortation and application to all of us we have all the nourishment we need to be able to be faithful as members of the body so no area of the body lacks because we get that nourishment from the head, from Christ. He's there for us. If we lack, if we're not faithful in our responsibilities as members, we go to the head and say, Lord, I need more food. I need more motivation. I need more conviction. I need more impetus of the Holy Spirit. I, I need cleansing. I need restoration. I need this, that, and the other thing to be able to come up to that level of faithfulness in every area of our lives. Some of you, it's not easy for you to get here to church on Sunday. I know that, but you find a way, right? Somehow, some way, you find a way. That means the head is supplying the nourishment and motivation you need to be able to get here. And so it is with every other area of responsibility. Union with Christ is all about the internal connection. Listen. Union with Christ is all about the internal connection between the head and the body. And we don't want to have any blockages, therefore, between us and Christ in that internal connection. The stronger the body is connected to Christ, the better the body functions. Are you hearing me? Mm -hmm. And the stronger it will be in the service to the Lord. Mm -hmm. The body will develop a, a greater living dynamic. The body will grow when we're more motivated and fed and directed by the head, we will not be static. We will not just sit in neutral, just schlepping along, going through the motions as a local church. We will be motivated to reach out with the gospel more. We'll be motivated to minister to one another more. We'll be inspired to go out of our way and extend ourselves, even stretching ourselves to the breaking point to be able to keep up with all of the forward-moving responsibilities that God gives us as a local church to grow corporately in the grace and knowledge of God. Amen? Amen. So in Ephesians 5.16, we read, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. Listen, from whom, from Christ, from Christ, that's the whom there, from Christ, the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. So Christ supplies every joint, every muscle of the body, so to speak, with the nutrition to be stronger, to have more health and more vitality spiritually so that our joining and knitting together with one another will be stronger. The more food you get, the stronger you will be in every muscle and in every uh, physical part of your being 
to have energy enough to do your work and to come home and do everything else you need to do. Note the phrases from whom and joined in Ephesians 5.16. That is, from Christ joined to Christ. The body will be weak if it is not firmly joined to the head, in other words, and so it is with a church that is not firmly joined to Christ. The elders of every single church, even those churches listening to this message, those pastors, those, those church leaders listening to this message on YouTube and over the Internet, it's our responsibility to remind the church and to teach the church and exhort the church to be strongly united to Jesus Christ, strongly uh, knitted to Him so that we can be strong in our relationships with one, another's, with one another. The ligaments and joints are strategic locations of support for the body. If all of your ligaments were weak in your joints, in your elbows, in your knees, in your ankles, you'd be almost falling down all the time. These, these strategic locations of support for the body, the ligaments and the joints, are ultimately dependent on the brain for nourishment. If the joints and ligaments are weak, then the whole body won't be able to support itself and will be weak. These support locations are symbolic of pastors, teachers, deacons, who provide vital support functions for the body of Christ. The more spiritual and holy the pastors are, the more spiritually healthy the body will be. But the body doesn't just receive. Once they, the members of the body, are built up through the ministry of one another, but especially the pastors and teachers and deacons, and the body receives the ministry and derives benefit and nourishment from it instead of falling asleep or uh, daydreaming or not really caring about being at the Bible studies and the prayer meetings and the worship service, then the body won't be strong, as strong as it should be. But the more spiritual and holy the pastors are, and the body receives that ministry and learns and grows and derives benefit and nourishment from it, the healthier the body will be. The brain is designed in such a miraculous way that it controls all the bodily functions simultaneously so that no part of the body lacks nourishment under its omnipresent efficacy. Think about that. While you're sitting here, your brain is controlling every single function of your body, directly or indirectly so that you're focused on one thing. And all the parts of your body are contributing towards that one focus right now. Right? Listening to this sermon. That's how dependent we are on the Lord Jesus Christ to control the whole body. And so this, this metaphor of head and body represents that internal connection between the body and the head. And we need to maintain that close connection with the Lord Jesus Christ so that we can be nourished in our individual life and in our corporate life. Amen? The second metaphor is the marriage union. The marriage union. That is the, the marriage union with Christ and the church. <clears throat> Specifically, we read in Ephesians 5, 23 and 30, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Verse 30. <clears throat> For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and his bones. The marriage union is the most intimate relationship in mankind and on earth. But God uses it as a metaphor to describe the intimacy between Christ and his church spiritually. The institution of marriage was designed so that a husband and wife could experience the very depths of every human faculty. Intimacy, emotionally, intellectually, <coughs> spiritually, and otherwise, unlike any other relationship. Infinitely more than your relationship with your siblings, your parents. The marriage relationship is designed to experience an intimacy emotionally, spiritually, and intellectually, and physically in a way that no other relationship can compare. In like manner, we've been equipped to have a relationship with God similar 
to that of an earthly marriage. And that's why it's so important to maintain a very close and open and healthy relationship with Christ. If you don't, if your relationship with Christ becomes lukewarm and distant and separated, the levels of intimacy that you experience this oneness with Christ in intellectually, spiritually, in your affections, in your zeal, in your worship, in your <coughs> service to Him, will diminish to a point where you won't have that joy of your spiritual marriage with Him. It'll be like in comparison to a physical marriage that loses all of that bliss. All of that bliss. And you're just going through the motions. You're just living together. We have been equipped to have a relationship with God similar to that of a marriage. We have intimate fellowship with God. We have intimate communion with Him. We have intimate companionship with Him and intimate friendship with Him. And we need to do everything with God's help, grace, and power to maintain that relationship. What do you make of this phrase from Isaiah 54, 5, where God says, For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is His name. Your maker is your husband. The implications of that statement are stunning. You can't avoid your husband. And if the relationship with your husband as the church is not right, he's not happy. And we ought to have the Holy Spirit telling us that we are not happy as well. He says in Jeremiah 3.14, I am married to you, and I will bring you to Zion. So he says, your maker is your husband, and I am married to you. It's a spiritual marriage, described in Ephesians 5 as having important benefits similar to an earthly marriage. Do you know that your relationship with Christ has benefits? When you got married to your wife, if you are married, or your husband, if you are married, there are a lot of benefits, a lot that you did not have when you were single. And when you enjoyed those benefits when you were married, you felt fulfilled in all these various areas that you were lacking in that you did not feel fulfilled in previously. In, in, in our spiritual marriage with Christ, we have benefits too. The first one is protection and safety. In Ephesians 5.23, it says that Christ is the Savior of the body. He saves us. He protects us from what? The ultimate agony, which is hell and the lake of fire. He's my protector, my Savior from hell. And from Satan's constant attempts to destroy me and to destroy you. He's my Savior. So when you talk glibly about, oh, Jesus is my Savior... He really saved us. We need to realize He saved me from hell. He saved me from an enemy that is constantly chomping at the bit to destroy everything I am and everything I have. Secondly, the benefits of this marriage is love and affection. He says, husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church. Ephesians 5.25a. We have the love of Christ for us. That's why you and I became saved. For God so loved the world. Yeah, He loves the world in general. He provides for them, feeds them, clothes them. But He reserves redemptive love only for His church, only for His sheep. He loves us in a redemptive way, a saving way, reserved only for us. So great is His love that He would give up and sacrifice His own life. And yes, in Ephesians, the parallel application is that husbands should love their wives so much that they would sacrifice for them, even their very lives. 
There's no greater love that one would have for one another than he would lay down his life for his friends. So sacrificial love is the highest form of love. And we have the love and affection of Christ as demonstrated in sacrificing his life for me. And he loves me so much. He is constantly praying for me. Even when I am disobeying him, while I am disobeying him, he is nonetheless praying for me, praying for the reversal of my disobedience to turn into obedience and submission and surrender. That's how great his love is. Thirdly, the benefit of holiness and cleansing. We read in verse 26 of Ephesians 5, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. But this idea of sanctification means in his relationship with his church, he is always purifying us, sanctifying us, cleansing us from a place of poisoning, pollution, and so forth. Through his prayers and through his death on the cross, he sanctifies me as his child. That's a great benefit. I need him every day. I don't know about you. I don't know if you think about this from time to time. But I think about it every day. I need the Lord Jesus Christ to uphold me, to cleanse me, to sanctify me, to purify me, to revive me. What a benefit. That not only is my salvation totally and completely in his hands, but my sanctification, my growth, my maturity, leading to glorification, is also in his hands. He's the Alpha and the Omega, but he's also everything in between. And that everything in between is my sanctification. I need him. I need that benefit. Or else we're, we're in big trouble. And the fourth one in verse 29 is that he nurtures, nurtures and cherishes the church. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. There's this higher function and work of our Lord Jesus, more than just generic sanctification and preserving grace. We see that there is this enthusiastic, delightful function that he derives in nourishing and cherishing us, his children. <clears throat> And so the spiritual union between Christ and the church is a, a mystical union or a mysterious union. Ephesians 5.32, just a little further down in our text, says this is a great <coughs> mystery concerning Christ and the church. It's mysterious in so many ways. But as it relates to the union, the marriage union between Christ and the church, it's a mystery. How can both enjoy spiritual intimacy and bliss in a realm beyond the senses? How can Christ enjoy his relationship with you when you cannot sense he's there physically? Sense, see him, hear him. How can he enjoy your... Well, it's a mystery. How can you enjoy your relationship with him when you cannot see him or hear him or touch him or smell his presence? Well, the Holy Spirit provides the conduit, the channel of spiritual pleasure and affection whereby both our spiritual husband and the bride enjoy pleasure as provided by the Holy Spirit in our hearts, in our spiritual man. <laughs> what a calling we have. What a calling. We forget, we forget, but we can repent and return to the Lord. He's not going to stop nourishing and cherishing and restoring and cleansing. But where is the main focus of our life? And do we and are we reminded frequently, maybe even daily, of this greatest priority of union with Christ and the maintaining of that union. If the Lord has reminded you of that great, awesome privilege and honor that he's given us, so few compared to billions, 
So few that he saves compared to billions in any given generation. Will you today take stock and inventory of anything and everything that is hindering that relationship and repent of it? Repent of it and come with sorrow and tears trembling before the throne of Christ saying, Lord, you and you alone are my greatest joy and purpose in life. Oh, restore to me the joy of my salvation and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Will you do that? Will you do that today and make that course correction with the help of God by his grace? Only those, listen, only those who have experienced this profound intimacy with Christ can understand it and appreciate it. And if you don't, if you go off today after hearing this most important message reminding you of your highest and holiest calling, if you go off hardened, disinterested, and dismissive of this greatest truth, I doubt and I question whether you are saved. Can I say that? If you are saved, you are so far where you need to be. So far away in backsliding land, in the wilderness of sin, that the most tender, sensitive, intimate, important message of the Bible that should speak volumes and should speak with power in our hearts bounces off like hard ground when seed is attempted to be planted in it. I, my heart goes out to you. There needs to be some major transforming work that needs to bring you back into the land of the living if you are indeed saved. Because the Bible describes this experience as the exceeding greatness of his power that we partake of, that we experience. It's described as the riches of the glory of this mystery, this mystery of union with Christ and communion with him is a mystery, but there are riches and glory to it that if you are truly saved, you understand and know what that is by way of experience. It's called unsearchable riches of Christ that when you partake of it, compared to every other blessing and positive thing you've gained or experienced or known in your life, you come to an understanding that, that the unsearchable riches are of Christ are in a category by itself and nothing else that you have that you value can even be compared to it is even worthy to be compared to it amen, amen. oh we have Christ the father's greatest treasure and he has willingly and lovingly shared his son with us and given his son to us describing it is as that you may know the riches of the glory of his inheritance. And no wonder why in Romans 11, the apostle says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. There is a depth to the glory of Christ and the knowledge of him and union with him that is so inexpressible. It passes understanding. It passes description. But on the affection side, it is described as sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. The union between Christ and the church is described in such sublime detail in the Song of Solomon, which we read. Which we read about. The one word that Pastor Owen used, if you, if you didn't get anything from his message a three to five minute message that came down on my head like a hammer. The one word I left with was the word lovesick. And when he brought that word out, I said to myself, am I lovesick? Am I hungry for Christ and his love? Do I want to partake of the preciousness of Christ? For the scripture says, to those who believe, he is precious. Is Christ precious to you? Are you lovesick for him and more of him? Because the Bible describes this relationship in such sublime detail. It says in the song 
5 1 I have come to my garden my sister my spouse I have gathered my myrrh with my spice I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey I have drunk my wine with my milk in the Old Testament and within the culture of Israel milk and wine and honey and the honeycomb and spices and myrrh are always descriptive of intimacy and sublimity in relationships. And God use all, uses all of these metaphors of these types of food and drink to describe Christ's relationship with the church. In other words, the greatest substances of earth that titillate the senses, the taste, the smell like myrrh and spice and honey and wine and milk, which is the, the richest kinds of herbs and spices and foods that one can taste and absorb and digest <coughs> that cause such a powerful reaction of delight to our taste buds and to our smell. God uses that as metaphors to describe how when knowing Christ in marital spiritual intimacy our spiritual senses should react in a similar way with such great delight and joy. Amen? Amen. Amen. <laughs> no, I'm not going crazy. I'm describing things that take place in a spiritual realm that cannot be seen or heard or touched but nevertheless it is the true experience of the believer with his or her Lord, his or her heavenly husband. Song 7 in verse 13. The mandrakes give off a fragrance, and at our gates are pleasant fruits. All manner, new and old, which I have laid up for you, my beloved. So here is a picture of the church, the beloved, the wife of Christ, the, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, taking time to lay up, to store up a variety of fruits. And one of those in particular, the mandrake, gives off a fragrance. Okay? The New Testament calls it the, the fact that believers are the fragrance of Christ. Why? Because we have spent so much time partaking with Jesus Christ as, as these fruits describe. We, we have a response to the Lord in fellowship, in love. We, when we read the Bible and meditate on it and pray, we are preparing our hearts to give Christ a proper, loving, spiritual response. Those are the fruits that we prepare that he's looking for to partake from us. Those are the mandrakes that he smells, that he's delighted in. And then in Psalm 2, verses 2 and 3, the text that I read in the scripture reading, he says, like a lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. Our Lord Jesus Christ looks down from his high and holy dwelling place on his throne um, to the sons of men. The eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth, beholding the good and the evil. And when he sees the evil, when he sees the billions of souls who are re in rebellion against him, in disobedience against him, casting off these constant overtures of grace and love, and he sees them as thorns. But every once in a while, among the thorns, he sees one of his daughters or sons, one of his marital chosen he see, and he says, it's like a lily among the thorns. When he sees us, he sees us as that lily. Like an apple tree among the trees of the woods, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down in his shade with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. I'll stop at that second metaphor. The metaphor of marriage union. There are three more in your notes, the building, the vine and branches, and sonship. We'll look at that some other time. But I want to stop right now, and I just want to close with an application. I don't know about you, but in my own relationship with Christ, in my own walk, 
with him, with all of its ups and downs through the years. The Holy Spirit has given me a desire and a hunger for him more than I've ever had in my life. And I hope the same is true for you. And I hope you will remember by what we have shared today from God's word, this great master plan that the Lord Jesus has for his church as depicted in the metaphor of the head connected with the body. And that we are to walk with him and live our lives with him in this earth as those in intimate fellowship and communion with him. And also the second metaphor, that of a marriage. We are to honor our marriage vows. We are to value them and esteem them very highly. We are to nurture them. You would be de devastated and destroyed with a sense of betrayal if your husband or your wife dishonored the marriage vows in any way. Those vows that cannot be, once you dishonor them, they cannot be repaired. It's done once you do it, once you dishonor those vows in a very scandalous way. And so it would destroy your spouse and that you would never be the same in your relationship again. Now, can you imagine how the Lord thinks as we constantly struggle to maintain the purity of our spiritual marriage with him? It's a very, very important relationship to him. And the sanctity and chastity of that relationship is very, very vital to him. Therefore, demonstrate to him in prayer and in your walk how important you feel your relationship with him is. Demonstrate in any area of your life that is out of sync with him. Demonstrate how you care so much about your marriage relationship with him that you're going to obey him in all areas that right now you're not obeying him and that you will repent of those things and that you will very quickly, with zeal and with the fear of God and with trembling, you will be obedient and you will honor your commitment as a church member in every area of your life. You will honor him in your responsibility to share the gospel and not hide your light under a lampstand. You will honor your commitment to your marriage to be able to edify and nourish other believers through using your gifts, through using hospitality, and not be isolated from the church for any duration, but maintain that intimate connection with one another. And you'll pray to him for courage to, and for him to remove the timidity and the complacency and the fear and the depression which is holding you down from doing all that you need to do in, you, in obedience to Christ and in honoring your marriage vows, not only in union and communion with him, but in the practical demonstration of your love for Christ by, by obeying every commandment and ordinance he's given you as a member of the local church and as an evangelist in the army of Christ to go forth with the gospel. We need to no longer squander our time but pray, Lord, teach us to number our days, for the days are evil, evil. That we might serve the Lord and walk with the Lord all the days of the rest of our lives. Amen? Amen. All the days of the rest of our lives. And for, Don't look at other people, other churches. Don't look at your circumstances, your needs. God will take care of all that. Just be faithful to Him in the inner man. He loves you. He's not going to let you go. He's not going to let you go. No matter what you do, he owns you, he has put his spirit within you, and he's going to honor his decree and his covenant with the Father to keep you in the faith and keep the Holy Spirit in you. And that the Spirit will constantly bring you back to Christ and will remind you, yes, you do love him and he does love you. Let's build on that love. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your faithfulness to our souls and not allowing us to lose sight of or forget about our great, great high calling in our union and communion with you. We thank you for your faithfulness, for you cannot deny yourself. And we thank you that when we are unfaithful, yet you remain faithful. Thank you, Lord, that you love us so much, even when we're not listening, even when we forget you, even when we don't return the love that you demonstrate to us. You still love us anyway. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you for your great love. Help us, Lord. We're all needy. I'm needy. We're all needy in one way or another. 
to push that reset button, repent and come back to you, and to restore and renew our marriage vows with you. And that open channel of love passing back and forth between us. Help us to do this, we pray, even today. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 <clears throat>